So, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate that. And I look around, around this room and see all these people that I know, and I feel completely intimidated. It works out a lot better when I do my radio show because I can't see anybody but my producer. And I know that he'll always bail me out, so I'm not worried about that. But when I look at people like Rod Arquette back here and others in this room, like my dear friends, the Osmonds, I get really nervous. So you'll have to put up with me today. No, Rod, you stay so that you can report on your radio show. What a great job I did. <laughs> I, I did mention earlier that uh, I looked up there and watched Rod being so organized and everything going so smoothly because Rod has helped me out several times on events that we've had. And sadly, we weren't quite as organized. And he just sits next to me while I grab his notes and change them every few minutes so that he knows what we want him to do next. So good presentation, Rod. So I'm, I hope that our presenter gets here. Uh, but let's, let's get started anyway with, with this uh, subject today about feminism. And uh, I am, in fact, uh, the first speaker today. I'm the chairman of this, but I also will be your first speaker. After I speak, uh, our second speaker is to be Representative Kim Coleman, but she's the one that's not here. So we may be skipping Kim, and hopefully she'll get here before we are, are finished. Uh, after that, we have Chelson Bakari, who uh, is with the Institution on Religion and Democracy. And, and following her is my friend Babette Francis, who is from Australia. She is the uh, head of Endeavor Forum there in Australia. And uh, I have known Babette for many years because I'm, I am part of an organization called Eagle Forum. And the founder of Eagle Forum is a wonderful lady by the name of Phyllis Schlafly. And Babette and Phyllis are friends. And so Phyllis started Eagle Forum, and Babette started Endeavor Forum in, in Australia. So, um, hopefully, Kim will get here, and we'll be able to include everybody. I'm going to have to hold on to this, which makes it very hard when you've got papers. My presentation today is feminism versus what, uh, uh, excuse me, feminine versus feminism, and what is the difference? And I need to make sure and get this started so I don't go over my time, because then I'll be telling everybody else what to do. I looked in the, in the uh, 1838 Webster Dictionary for the definition of feminine. It said, pertaining to a woman or women, soft, tender, delicate. Then I looked in the most recent Webster Dictionary for the definition of feminine, where it said, relating to or suited to women or girls. Verbal illustration, a feminine look, appearance, feminine beauty, mystique. Then I looked in the 1838 Dictionary for the definition of feminism or feminist. Now remember, the 1838 Diction Webster Dictionary was the original dictionary and the word feminism did not exist then. In the current dictionary, the definition of feminism says, the theory of the political, economic, and social equality of the sexes, organized activity on behalf of women's rights and interests. The definition of feminist says so someone advocating social, political, and economic rights for women equal to those of men. There is not a positive definition for feminism or feminists, and only a positive or endearing definition for feminine. You know, many years ago, I went over to Brigham Young University to attend a meeting that I heard about. I wanted to sit in on this meeting because it was a meeting of, of feminists at BYU, and I wanted to know what they had to say. Well, when I got to that meeting, the room was full of a lot of cute young women and a few young men. As they introduced themselves, they would go around the room and they would say, hello, my name is Mary, and I'm a Mormon feminist. Or hello, my name is John, and I'm a Mormon feminist. I was really interested in that. As they got to me, I just introduced myself as Gal Razika, and that I was just there to observe, that I was interested in what they had to say. Well, the minute I said that, one young woman jumped up, burst into tears, and ran out of the room. I had offended her, and I wasn't even sure what I had said wrong. 
So as the meeting progressed, it was a very interesting meeting to listen to these young women, along with their advisor, go back and forth on feminism. When it was over, a very lovely young woman walked up to me and said to me she'd like to talk to me. She wanted to ask me some questions. And she wanted to know why I was there and what my concerns were with feminism. So I asked her some questions. I asked her, well, what is your definition of feminism? She said things like, strong and in charge. A woman that doesn't let a man tell her what to do, but instead she takes charge. I said, okay. So do you know any feminists? Oh, yes, she did know feminists. Well, tell me about them. Well, her favorite feminist was her mother. Her mother had been such a great example to her, she said, of what a woman should be like and what a real feminist was. I says, well, tell me about your mother. You know, and, and she mentioned her mother was not there. I said, is she here today? And she says, no, she, she's with my father. Well, where's your father? Well, he's a mission president far across the sea. I said, really? And your mother went with him? What is she doing there? And she says, well, she's the mission mother. I said, well, she couldn't be the mission mother if he wasn't the mission president. And she followed him halfway across the world. Oh, yes. I says, well, what did she do before she went with your father? Well, she took care of us. Uh, she was a wonderful mother, she said, and what a great wife. And I said, I love the sounds of your mother. A wonderful mother who cared for her children, loved her husband, took care of her home, and now is serving the Lord beside her husband. Amazing. I says, that's just not my definition of feminism. I told her, I says, let me tell you about some other women I know that are just like your mother. I told her about Phyllis Schlafly, who started Eagle Forum, how Phyllis was a constitutional attorney, had six children and a full-time stay-at-home mother, and yet had spent her life in service of others. I even mentioned myself and some of the things that I do, and I said, I'm not a feminist. Phyllis is not a feminist, and neither is your mother. So what is meant by feminism, and what is it that they want, that they think will make them equal to men? They want the Equal Rights Amendment passed, abortion on demand at any time during pregnancy, and financed by taxpayers, homosexual and lesbian privileges, affirmative action quotas for women, government child care, legalization of prostitution, assigning women to military combat duty, political action at every level of government. Here is the translation of their jargon. Reproductive freedom means abortion on demand throughout nine months of pregnancy for any reason whatsoever. Medicaid funding means taxpayer funding of abortions. Young women's rights means abortion for the minor girl without parental consent. Civil rights for all means quota hiring for minorities and women. Lesbian and gay rights means the entire homosexual agenda, including priv privileges to teach in the classroom, adopt children, be Boy Scout leaders, etc. Legislation to decrease the feminization of poverty means the entire feminist, liberal, economic, social agenda, including federally financed and regulated daycare. Compar comparable worth, that means gov government fix wage fixing. Federally ma mandated par parental leave, that means forcing employers to skew, skew employ employee benefits in favor of feminist demands. Glass ceiling, that means government forcing businesses to promote women to executive positions. The United Nations Treaty on D Discrimination Against Women, that means equal rights amendment enforced on Amer Americans by a commission of international busybodies. Repeal of all laws that exempt women from combat duty in the U.S. military. Gender balance laws or, or appointments on a gender, on gender basis means that a candidate's commitment to appoint women because they are, they are just because they are women instead of men to all government positions. The goal is to put women in all positions of power and authority. Several years ago, Lawrence Summers, who was the president of Harvard University, suggested some studies to be undertaken to see whether there are any innate gender differences that might explain why fewer differences that might, excuse, that, uh, 
explain why fewer women than men have succeeded in science and math careers in academia. That was the torch that ignited an international media firestorm. Storm. President Summers said he had tried gender-neutral upbringing with his own little daughter by giving her toy trucks to play with. She immediately pretended they were dolls and named them Daddy Truck and Baby Truck. <laughs> Mr. Summers wasn't, procla wasn't proclaiming a new scientific discovery. Sex differences from the cradle are known by, to every parent and were explained to the public in a delightful, in delightful detail in John Stossel's famous ABC documentary called Boys and Girls Are Different. Because President Summers had suggested these studies, feminists demanded that Summers immediately submit to a week of intense discussion to get him to admit his guilt. Other feminists ran to the internet and to their friends in the media to activate indignation and personal attacks. Senator Ron Wyden was quoted nationally saying that Summers knows that he has clearly crossed the line. After two weeks of constant harassment and demands that he use only feminist permitted language, a contrite Summers apologized over and over again. It was unconditional surrender. He appointed not one but two task force, one on women in the Harvard faculty and another specifically on women in science and engineering to recruit, support, and promote women. The feminist goal is to eradicate from our culture everything that is masculine and remake us into a gender neutral society. Feminists are falsely touted by the media as the voice of women, even though all polls show that the big majority of women reject the label feminists. In fact, you know, while the women were out there, uh, the radical feminists, and they were on their, working on their agenda, they went to lawmakers, the media, and they told them all that we speak for women. And while they were out there speaking for us, the rest of us were home rearing our children and taking care of things that we need, wanted to take care of. And then one day, we had a wake-up call. That wake-up call was called the Equal Rights Amendment. You know, we, we were sending our husbands out the door to slay dragons so we could stay home. But suddenly we found ourselves in a situation where those dragons were coming in our front door, and we had to do something about it. With our children on our side, we had to go out and slay dragons. And I still resent that till this day. But, you know, there was this woman, this woman whose name was Phyllis Schlafly, and she went out and started to tell people that the Equal Rights Amendment was not something that was good. Now, we're all for equal rights, and many people thought that it was a really good thing. But as she began to have these meetings in her home and invite women in and explain to them what it was all about, they went out and they told other women. The meetings got larger, and more people got involved. And when uh, suddenly we had an army, an har army across this nation, of women, women who went out to slay dragons, save their family, and defeat the ERA. There are many feminist groups that may appear to have different missions, but they have a common ideology. That is, women are victims of an oppressive patri patriarchal society, and all men are guilty, both individually and collectively. Women's problems are not personal, but societal and require constitutional or legislative remedies. The feminists use the YWCA to teach radical feminists to the feminism to the next generation. The Girl Scouts went feminist after they took Betty Friedan on their board. They dropped loyalty from the oath, began a condom-friendly sex ed program, and make, made belief in God optional. A feminist showed a St. Louis reporter her scrapbook of treasured pictures. Not any grandchildren, but of Gloria Steinem, Betty Friedan, Bella Azug, and Florence Kennedy. Pathetically, she fantasized that the Equal Rights Amendment, when it passes, will make her happy. A study released by the National Bureau of Economic Research called The Paradox of Declining Female Happiness concluded that women's happiness had measurably declined since 1970. 
since this study covers the same time period as the rise of the so-called women's liberation movement, the feminist re feminists recognized it as a challenge to their goals and alleged achievements of their movement. Only one sentence confronts the fundamental reason why today's women are not as happy as women were in 1972. Time magazine wrote, among the most dramatic changes in the past generations is the detachment of marriage and motherhood. That's what the feminist movement did to America. All those impressive statistics about women holding well-paying jobs and receiving college degrees will not produce happy women as long as 41% of children are born to unmarried mothers who lack a loving husband. And one more glaring point, the lack of grandchildren in rejecting marriage and children. Feminists also reject the grandchildren who could have provided a significant measure of women's happiness. Feminine is the biblical definition of women, and it is through following God's plan for women that families will be strengthened and will survive in these perilous times. Thank you very much. And next, we will, we'll, we will go next to you. Um, so while, while we're waiting, you, you can come up now. Um, it appears that uh, Representative Coleman will not be joining us, so we will have time. Each, each of the presenters will take 15 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions and answers if you would like to do that. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. I am Chelsea Vicari. I'm just going to set up my stopwatch here so they don't ramble on. And you'll have to... Give me some grace when I public speak, I get nervous, and when I get nervous, I tell jokes, and I'm not funny. So just bear with me. Uh, just pretend to laugh at my cheesy jokes. But uh, I work for the Institute on Religion and Democracy. What that means is we are a group of ecumenical Christians who monitor social issues affecting the church. Dr. Janice Shaw Krauss was a mentor of mine, and she asked me to join this panel, and I have to admit that, admit that I was a little uh, skeptical about joining this particular panel because I know feminism can be a very muddled word. There are, very, there are a lot of different types of feminists or definitions of feminism, and so I want to be very clear that in my discussion, for my purposes, when I use the word feminism, I'm specifically talking about radical feminism, started in the 1960s, second wave feminism, and how it has developed into third wave feminism and pop femi feminism. Uh, and when I say pop feminism, I mean Beyonce or Lena, Dun Lena Dunham. So just, I, I want to be perfectly clear on that because I do find it difficult to paint feminism with one brush or one color. Uh, I, when I was, uh, coming into this, the, this discussion, I met someone who is kind of in the center, uh, a feminist who supports motherhood, and then I thought about feminists for life. But that's not what concerns me. What concerns me is the impact that radical feminism still has on today's millennial women, and that's what I want to talk about. Um, this is sure to be a stirring discussion, so I'm really grateful that we have time for Q&A today. Uh, but I've, so I, I grew up really wanting to have strong female role models because I grew up where I was in a household where my mom was a full-time stay-at-home mom and I really believed that she had made all the wrong choices. I thought that she had sacrificed her own dreams for the sake of family. I thought that she was oppressed. I thought that she was a bit weak, too dependent. But thank God I have since realized that she had her own dreams, and those dreams did entail motherhood. They did entail raising children. They entailed sacrificing her secure job at an insurance company to stay at home with me and my siblings. So I've kind of been on this journey of appreciating what truly having it all for women looks like. And it doesn't look like the picture that I had in my head. So, for example, Lifetime Television and magazines taught me that having it all looked like this high-rise, powerful uh, career, office, brunch on Sunday, getting to sleep in because you don't have children on Saturdays. It looked like independence and liberation. It did not look like family, right? Liberation, I was taught subtly by my feminist professors, television, books, that enslavement of women 
truly look like a family. And I was taught to avoid all of those things. But I've come to see things very differently. I think the picture in my head was actually turned upside down. And so what I want to talk to you about is just, I will briefly discuss three ways that I, I truly believe that radical feminism and the name of third wave feminism, and most recently pop feminism, as I mentioned, are continuing to fool women like me who think that having it all doesn't look like family. The first th thing I want to examine is that feminism does continue to strip women of their freedom to choose. And again, I go back to my mom on this. She chose to have a family. I asked her, I've, by the way, I've since apologized to her for thinking that she was somehow weak for making the decision to be a full-time mom. But I asked her before preparing for this talk, did you ever feel criticized by other women for your decisions? And she said, she definitely did. That one woman asked her, I think it was at a bunko party or something, uh, what do you do? And she said, I'm a mom. And the lady's response was, oh, I'm so sorry. You have to stay at home with your children all day long. And I said, wow, mom, I'm, I'm really sorry that there is still a stigma associated with motherhood that is a remnant of the 1960s second wave feminism. So I back again to, but that was my mother's choice. And nobody was talking about her choice to be a mom. And this is a quote that I find very interesting. In 1949, second wave feminist, foremother Simone de Beauvoir, wrote a feminist manifesto in which she bluntly denied women the option to choose for themselves their own ambitions. She said, quote, no woman should be allowed to stay at home to raise her children. Women should not have that choice precisely because if there is such a choice, too many women will make that one, unquote. <laughs> Feminism still places stigmas around motherhood and homemaking as a type of inferior career, but I'm grateful that there are women working to change that perspective. I want to read to you a quote also by Phyllis Schlafly, who I greatly admire, longtime pro-life activist, lawyer, mother of six, author of 20 books, and obviously a woman who was not limited by her choice to be a mom and wife. In her book, The Flip Side of Feminism, Schlafly said, quote, while people associate feminism within the 1960s revolution, that is when feminism began. Feminism and feminists didn't disappear just because they're no longer marching in the streets. Schlafly explained, quote, they simply chucked the loud protests and morphed into the fabric of society, unquote. And I just want to follow that statement up by saying, de Beauvoir's legacy, the quote that I read you about not giving women the option to choose, continues to live on um, with millennial women, with the prominent third wave feminist um, advocates. Most notable, I would say, is Jessica Valenti, who seeks to dismantle arguments surrounding chastity and modesty. In her book, Full Frontal Feminism, A Young Woman's Guide to Why Feminism Matters, Valenti writes, whether it's reproductive rights, violence against women, or just plain old vanilla, vanilla sexism, most issues affecting women exist to keep women in their place, unquote. For feminists like Valenti, valuing virginity equates to the sexual oppression of women by men. But what's ironic to me is that during the discussions that third wave feminism have when it comes to the chastity issue, is that they often leave out the women who make the choice for themselves to save their virginity for their husbands. I was married two weeks ago, and I'm not bragging, but I, I did make that decision. So when I read their articles, their way feminist articles, about this topic, they don't look to me or to other women like me and get my perspective. It's just, this is old vanilla sexism, if we're talking about chastity. Or they look to the fathers and say, that promise that that young girl made to her dad that she would save herself, that's just another way to oppress that men to oppress this young girl. But I made that decision long ago on completely on my own, and I would like to be brought into the discussion. But I think it's sad to say that, like homemaking in the 1960s and on, the idea of choice in terms of our sexuality is just a one-way street, because there's only one choice tolerated by radical feminism, and that seems to be sexual experimentation. 
the young woman who chooses to honor God and maintain their virginity, they're not mentioned, and they're typically dismissed to the margins. I think this has to change, and there has to be a greater discussion. And if you're going to have that discussion, you have to start by bringing in those women who are making different choices from you. But feminism is only happy with one choice, when that choice does not include chastity, modesty, family, children, and full-time homemaking. But I don't want you to just take my word for it. Earlier, Dr. Uh, Dr. Charmaine Yost brought up Rebecca Walker, who was the daughter of notorious feminist Alice Walker, the author of The Color Purple. Rebecca, who was a leader within the third wave feminist movement, actually admits that she yearned for a traditional mom because her own mother believed that children enslaved women, and eventually her mom disowned her, actually. Rebecca wrote in an article, quote, when I hit my 20s, I could feel my biological clock ticking, but I felt if I listened to it, I would be betraying my mother and all she had taught me. In fact, having a child has been the most rewarding experience of my life. My only regret is that I discovered the joys of motherhood so late. I have been trying for a second child, but so far with no luck. Feminism has betrayed an entire generation of women into childlessness, but far from taking responsibility for this, the leaders of the women's movement close ranks against anyone who dares to question them, as I have learned to my cost." Unquote. My worry is that we're going to have similar ramifications with sexuality, deconstructing gender, and encouraging sexual experimentation. We don't want women in the next 20 years to look back and say, I wish that the feminists around me had told me what the consequences would be or how emotionally broken sexual experimentation would leave me. Second, I need to move on because I know time is, is running short. But I want to continue my discussion on how radical femi feminism continues to diminish the dignity of women. How has feminism helped to dismantle how men treat women is, is certainly something to be examined. Because the 1960s quote, if it feels good, do it, and free love movement have advanced, in my opinion, today's hookup culture that we see. So consider how much more sexually objectified women are in the dating realm. Women were taught by the influence of, of radical feminism that to be equal means sameness. And therefore, women must be sexual prowess and experience sex with multiple partners because remember that chastity and monogamy, quote, oppress women, unquote. So now, what we have in the dating realm, take my word for it, uh, men scroll our profile pictures on apps like Tinder or mingle this and that and more unheard of dating apps, which I think you'll like, so I took time to write them down. The forthcoming Thrinder, which is the Tinder for threesomes, and my new favorite, quote, Pure, which describes itself as the Uber of dating apps. This is what we have come to now. We no longer have courtship. We have apps that are downloaded to our phones where men scroll our pictures and our well-crafted sound bites, determining if we are good enough for a hookup, not marriage. Women's worth and beauty, according to the cover of women's magazines, operated by self-professed feminists, also measure how well we achieve our dignity by our makeup and uh, our sexuality. I was scanning some of the recent headlines, and these are some of the, the glossy magazine cover uh, taglines, quote, how to be sexy for your man, learn the secrets he is afraid to tell you but secretly wants in bed, and 10 beauty, si 10 beauty tips that will make you look like a celebrity. If that is radical feminism's idea of dignity and value, then no thank you, because I have yet to understand how to apply bronzer correctly. So I am just, I'm just, you know, doomed. But here's a, here's a kicker, and something I find really interesting, is that not all prominent feminists have taken their own advice when it comes to uh, modesty or monogamy. Uh, why? Because it's not good advice. Dr. Janice Shaw Krauss, who is the executive director of World Congress of Families 9, she was the first to point this hypocrisy out to me. And I'm really thankful she did. Helen Gurley Brown was Cosmopolitan's editor-in-chief. She was a 60s feminist icon and author of Sex and the Single Girl, which encouraged women to experience multiple sexual partners outside of marriage. But Gurley Brown did not take her own advice. She opted instead for a stable, monogamous marriage and was married faithfully to her husband, David Brown, for 51 years until he died in 2010. Why wasn't she writing a book about a stable, monogamous marriage? 
why sex and the single girl? Because she didn't want to even take that advice. Moving on, I want to discuss how feminism has objectified women by turning the most vulnerable into nothing more than dispos disposable tissue. Abortion is perhaps radical feminism's greatest accomplishment wrought in its ensnarement of women under the guise of compassion and care for women's health and so-called reproductive justice, feminism has snatched away the most fundamental of all women's rights, just the right to live. And here in the United States, we recently discovered that this movement, launched and led by radical feminis feminism, goes just beyond the murder of unborn babies, but to the trafficking of their dismembered parts for profit. That doesn't sound very pro-woman to me. Several weeks ago, I came across a disturbing article written by a young feminist woman. She was about my age. She was blonde, attractive, millennial. Her article tagline read, quote, I love providing abortion care to women, and I am proud to do so. I am also far from alone, unquote. Wow, I thought, she's brazenly talking about the murder of unborn babies. This is going to be a train wreck. I've got to read this. So of course, I click on it. And the article, which was published on a woman's website, XO Jane, the young author's name was Caroline Payne. She unfortunately, as a millennial woman, pushed the same tired old feminist narrative that tells women, without abortion, you are inadequate. She writes, quote, I provide abortions and actively take every opportunity to advance my abortion skills because without abortion and family planning, women will never live in an equal world, let alone rule the world, unquote. She continues on to write, Women should have every opportunity to, to explore their potential in the public square, and they will never be able to do that if they cannot exert agency and autonomy over their bodies. Republicans know this, and misogynists know this too. My response to that, which was a bit harsher before my editor got a hold to my piece, but <laughs> I, wrote, I wrote in response, I had to, I couldn't let this opportunity go by, was that, when, yes, abortion is about women. Payne got that right, but not the way that she sees it, because it's about the murder of innocent, vulnerable, ba vulnerable baby girls, and of course, baby boys, who are never given an opportunity to go to school, play sports, or as Payne put it, quote, compete along the career trajectory with men, unquote. Abortion allows for sex selection abortion, and this tragically works to the detriment of the world's tiniest women. Misogynists know this too, by the way, and so do abortion advocates. According to the Population Research Institute, because of sex selection abortion, 71 million more boys than girls have been born globally since 2000. This is what gender inequality looks like, my friends, and you can think abortion. So imagine instead empowering women by simply allowing them the chance to live. How much time do I have left? None. <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> There's no way I can summarize. So I just would leave you with, there are many types of feminism, but what I'm most concerned with are the still lingering influences of radical feminism on today's millennial young women. And I encourage you as strong female leaders to continue mentoring the young women around you. Because like I said, I was craving strong female leadership. I just didn't realize that it came in the form of my mom. So I'm so thankful for her now and all that she's taught me. Thank you very much, Gail, for your introduction. Um, uh, years ago, I used to think in the 60s that I was the only one who opposed contemporary feminism. And then I heard of heroines like uh, Phyllis Schlafly and Gail Drazika, and I knew I wasn't nuts. <laughs> uh, they'd say the definition of a conservative is a liberal who's been mugged by reality. And I want to relate, I want to relate that to Gail Drazika's uh, insistence that uh, boys and girls, men and women, are different. Um, my husband and I had eight children, four girls and four boys. 
our first three children were girls, and our house was filled with girl toys, you know, prams and dolls. And my third daughter had a beautiful bride doll with a orange blossom and the veil and so on. And when our son arrived, um, he, the house was filled with girl toys, and we didn't stop him playing with them, but he played with them differently. There was a big crisis one day when he got hold of Prudence's bride doll, and he took the head off. He unscrewed it. <laughs> he wanted to see how it was made up. And my husband said, uh, boys are different, aren't they? You know, very sagely he commented. So we, you know, we're mugged by reality. Um, that's my introduction. But the title of my presentation is um, The Vanishing Woman, you know, Feminism's Consequences. Um, the early feminists in the early 20th century, early, late 19th century and 20th century uh, fought for equal rights for women, the right to vote, the right for women and their children to be financially supported, and they opposed excessive indulgence in alcohol, which diminished that support. The second wave of feminism in the 1960s and 1970s became a trifle confused. Instead of demanding support for their children, they insisted on the right to abort them, thus letting irresponsible fathers off the hook. Uh, feminists... Um, argued at one and the same time that there were no differences between men and women, but, they, but the, uh, if uh, uh, more women were in positions of uh, power, the world would be a more compassionate place. When you, when you sort of pointed out this was illogical, they said, well, logic is a male construct. Uh, m women work differently. We function with intuition and empathy. <laughs> um, at, and also, at that time, they wanted to promote a sort of unisex androgynous society. But uh, they were relatively sane, but I think fem uh, feminism today has reached... Uh, I leave you to judge whether how, how, how sane they are, because they have not merely abandoned um, the logic, uh, any remnants of logic they had. Instead of a unisex society, or even celebrating women, as in Helen Reddy's 1970 song, I am woman, hear me roar. The whole concept of womanhood is lost in a plastic miasma of 58 different genders. I don't have time to list all these genders, but um, Bruce Jenner is an example. Uh, he's, he's encroached on women's turf and claims to be Caitlin. And he's now been nominated a Woman of the Year by Glamour magazine, even though he still has uh, all the male equipment. Um, when I spoke about Bruce Jenner at Phyllis Schlafly's conference uh, uh, a month ago, um, uh, 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 how he was regarded as courageous, claiming to be a woman, but a man who said he was a chicken would be regarded as insane, uh, I, was <laughs> I was joking about it. But lo and behold, uh, there is a man in England who identifies with parrots. And could you put that on the screen, please, Mr. Technician? I need a man to help me with this technical equipment. <laughs> Uh, this is a man who thinks he's a parrot, and he's had, um, he's had feathers implanted. I was joking about this at Phyllis Schlafly's conference, that uh, why do we just stop a transgender, why not trans species? And, uh, you know, provide uh, men with feathers and beaks and so on. And lo and behold, the man in England has done just that. Uh, this man, his name is uh, Ted Richards, and he's got uh, feathers and, a be and he's, he's had his ears removed and he's looking for a surgeon who will make his nose into a beak. This is real, I'm not joking. So now I'm afraid to joke because my jokes become reality. <laughs> he's, and uh, some of the doctors of medical professions have said, well, the men who, the surgeons who removed his ears are unethical. But what about the surgeons who castrate young men and cut off the breasts of young women to, you know, so that they can identify with, think that they're of the opposite sex? So there's some seriousness in this. Uh, Bruce Jenner was regarded as brave, as I said, for coming out as a woman. But what if he said he was a chicken? Or say he said he was Napoleon? Uh, I come from India, where a lot of Hindus believe in reincarnation. And they would much more likely believe that Bruce Jenner was a reincarnated Napoleon than that a man who fathered several children, as Bruce Jenner has, that he was a man. So it depends on your definition of sanity, of what you believe about Bruce Jenner. Uh, now, our Victorian government has appointed, um, recently appointed a gender and sexuality commissioner. Her name is Rowena Allen, and she derives her inspiration directly from American Native Americans. She is quoted in a recent article in Melbourne's Age newspaper as follows. 
I identify as a walker, which is, Native which is a Native American term for someone who walks between genders. Uh, at any point, people will call me a male or sir, which is great when you're buying a car, but I'm just as comfortable in a group of women. She also identifies as a lesbian. And how does one select one's gender? Well, there are 58 genders you can pick from, as you know, on Facebook. Uh, the Yogi Carter principles enunciated by a handful of human rights lobbyists and a radical homosexual group who met in Yogi Carta. Yogi Carta isn't another gender, by the way. It's a place in Indonesia. <laughs> in case you're wondering. <laughs> Sorry. OK. <laughs> um, Anyway, they met in Yogyakarta and uh, determined in a preamble that gender identity, gender identity refers to each person's deeply felt internal and individual experience of gender, which may or may not correspond with the sex assigned at birth. Um, some people, some feminists are complaining that um, obstetricians are uh, heterosexist when they hold up the baby after they deliver it and says, um, Mrs. So-and-so, you'll have a lovely boy or a lovely girl. They said you shouldn't predetermine what the child's, ge child's gender is going to identify with later on in life. You mustn't kind of uh, preset it. After I spoke on the deconstruction of gender at Phyllis Schlafly's Eagle Council in September, a delegate emailed me to say I had not mentioned vampires. So here goes. Apparently in Idaho has a a number of vampires who are being studied by Idaho State University sociology professor D.J. Williams, who says that uh, some suffer so severely from lethargy that they believe they require extra energy in the form of blood or attending um, large gatherings of people. So maybe there are some vampires here who are deriving energy from our large gathering. <laughs> um, this is serious academic study, by the way. Uh, his research was published in the latest journal of um, uh, critical social work, along with co-author uh, Emily Pryor of the Center for Positive Sexuality in Los Angeles. Williams said his uh, paper, Do We Always Practice What We Preach? Real Vampires' Fears of Coming Out of the Coffin to Social Workers and Helping Professionals is aimed at making um, clinicians more aware of the group's, uh, the, the group's vampire community. We live in an age of technology. We live in a time when people can select new alternative identities to fit how they understand themselves better. We really need to understand some of these new identities and new ways to identify ourselves. And some of these new identities do not fit into stereotypes. Helping professionals of all varieties need more education on these kinds of topics. And uh, he says, vampires cross all religious and socioeconomic boundaries. It's not a religion. It's more akin to sexual orientation. So they've got a new sexual orientation now. Williams himself, himself is not a vampire. He said, real vampires who drink blood re represent a small uh, percentage of uh, vampires. And it's not un uncommon to make a small incision on a chest. Uh, usually the blood is from a donor or partner. Uh, this, this study has been published in the Idaho State Journal, and I presume it would pass for academic scholarship these days. I'm not joking about this. I'm afraid to make jokes because you might easily get a vampire in the White House or whatever, you know. So, <laughs> Anyway, there are vampires in Idaho, so just take note of them. <laughs> uh, Endeavor Forum is an NGO, that's my organization. It's an NGO accredited to the Economic and Social Council of the UN. But we decided to apply for that accreditation because we discovered that the policy, uh, many of the policies and promotions came down from UN treaties, and the, pol the policy of multiple genders was one of the ones that came from the UN. At that time, they were very modest. They were only uh, looking for seven genders. And the situation reached high drama at one session of the Commission on the Status of Women because the representative of Nicaragua wouldn't sign on to seven genders. He said uh, he only believed in male and female. And um, Nicaragua is a poor country, very dependent on Western foreign aid. And the, I think the government of Sweden said to the government of Nicaragua, if you don't withdraw your delegate from the UN, we'll cut off aid. So anyway, Max Padilla was recalled home, and they sent another delegate from Nicaragua. And when he came, the debate resumed, but he hadn't been properly briefed on what he was supposed to say, because he kind of looked down at his papers and said, um, 
but in my country, we only have men and women. <laughs> so this is what passes for debate at the UN. And uh, anyway, it's now seven genders is all held because on Facebook, you have a choice of 58 genders. Um, this is what passes for debate at the UN, and your taxes are paying for much of it because the United States is the, is the major funder of the UN. Um, now, the more serious part, I've been telling jokes which I hope won't come true, but even more sinister at the moment is the alliance of contemporary feminism with the UN for an advocacy of abortion rights and population control, which is inflicted on the developing countries of the world, including my country of birth, uh, India. This is the ultimate betrayal of womanhood. While loud with the rhetoric of choice, the silence is deafening from feminism today about China's compulsory abortion after one child policy and female infanticide. This policy and the cultural preference in India for male children has resulted in a grave sex imbalance and ratio between males and females. There are millions of missing females, girl babies aborted before birth in both China and India. This practice also occurs among Asian communities living in Western democracies. And instead of lobbying against it, feminists have defended it and said that wherever, whatever her reason for abortion, including having, having a fetus of the wrong sex, a woman should not be deprived of the right to abort. In Victoria, my home state in Australia, a pro-life doctor, Mark Hobart, was investigated and warned of, the, of deregistration by the Medical Practitioners Board after he refused to provide a referral for a couple whom, who he said uh, claims wanted an abortion at 19 weeks gestation because they desired a boy rather than a girl. Excuse me a minute. In a, homily, in a homily for the mass of the election of the Pope before the conclave where he was elected Pope, Pope Benedict XVI said, we are building a dictatorship of relativism that does not recognize anything as definitive and whose ultimate goal consists of one's own ego and desires. The egos and desires of contemporary feminism have led to over more than 30 million missing women in China alone. The second uh, line of Helen Reddy's song, um, I Am Woman, uh, in, is in numbers too big to ignore. Well, the numbers too big to ignore are the ones of the, of the women who are missing. Gloria Steinem, in an interview uh, last Friday on CBS, said that for the first time in world history, there are fewer women than men. That is a sad epitaph and betrayal of the ideals of the feminisms of the 19th and early 20th centuries. And I'm relying on all of you to help, help me right this terrible situation. Uh, contemporary feminism today is not only insane in many respects, but it's also a tremendous betrayal of women and motherhood and girl and girl babies. Thank you very much. Well, uh, our other speaker didn't didn't arrive, and so. We will have time uh, to take some questions if you'd like to do that. I do want to say one thing, though. Uh, as I set through this, because I had spent time putting together this presentation on feminism, um, you know, really I got to thinking about so many things. Because this, this very issue uh, is, it was actually the beginning of the organization that I'm involved in, Eagle Forum, because Phyllis Schlafly... Uh, set out to stop, to stop the ERA. You know, we're a much broader organization than that now, but back then, that's what it was about. And so we were speaking across the country, talking about uh, radical feminism and the problems that were ahead of us. And I, I thought so much as, as I was going back and looking into all these things that we did in the past, and the things that we would say was going to happen. If the ERA fa passes, if the radical feminists get their way, Look at all the things that would happen. We talked about how there would be abortion on demand. When we brought that up, oh, there you go again with your radical ideas. When we talked about women in the military and that the day could come when they could even be drafted, there you go again with your radical ideas. Well, we're not to the draft yet because they haven't instituted the draft. 
but the, we can see what's happening with women in the military. And so goes the list. Everything that was part of the Equal Rights Amendment is now part of our life because they made sure that they got it. Even though we were able to defeat it, even after Congress gave them a seven-year illegal extension. So I was thinking about the things as I sat through the meetings today and all of the things that we've been hearing about today, all the problems, abortion, the terrible things that have happened as far as marriage is concerned, and, and anti-discrimination laws, the homosexual movement in every way, and all the things that you just heard about all the genders. All of these things started with and have come about because of the radical feminist movement. And it's bigger and stronger and more in your face than ever before. Okay, let's, let's go to questions, okay.